Um, my name is Nick Lyons, and I am a senior motion designer at Territory Studio in London. And today I'm going to be talking about the work that we did on the latest Avengers Infinity War and the reimagining of the Guardians of the Galaxy ship. So if you saw Guardians 2, you saw their ship got destroyed. They need a new ship. They need u new user interfaces. And we were brought on board to help create all that. So I'm going to go ahead and show you our reel just to give you an idea of the type of work we do. Um, we're known mostly for our future user interface work, but this will show you um, a bit more of our film work and uh, give you a better idea of what we do. Thank you. Um, so I work in London now, but uh, that wasn't always the case. I'm originally from California, and I have some behind the scenes footage of me running from the hills of Los Angeles to London on my big adventure abroad. And uh, it was just a few years ago that I began working at Territory Studio. And uh, we work on a lot of film work, a big kind of range of different types of films, um, different films and installation work. Uh, the link that kind of ties all the work that we do together is how we envision the future. So uh, directors will come to us, uh, producers will come to us, and they've seen our work and how we envision uh, futuristic technology. And we apply that to everything that we do. So the kind of the unifying factor in all these different films based on, you know, we have Zoolander, we have comedy movies, we have action movies, dramas, is how we envision the future and how people interact with that on a day-to-day -day basis and what that looks like. The work that we do at Territory is as varied as um, the clients that we have. All the work that we do um, influences uh, every different uh, category. So the screen graphics we do are the most widely seen. Generally, that's the film work, um, the work that I'll be talking about today. But the experience, brand work, games work, future tech work, and all these other pieces help influence the look and feel for um, the films that we do. So the different, um, the foundation of the studio, and when you walk into our London office, kind of the, um, the pillars of the studio are on the wall here, along with some of the films and projects we've had the chance to work on. Uh, design, story, and technology. And these are how we approach every single film and every single project. Uh, a director will come to us with a narrative, a client will come to us with, the, with an idea, and we'll start off with their story. And from there, we'll figure out what the best design is for that story. Um, a lot of times, uh, if, you, if you work in design or if you work in production at all, you have a very short amount of time to connect with the audience or to, to connect with the person that you're trying to, uh, trying to uh, market or share the story with. So our designs have to be very clean and coherent. They have to really match the the idea of the director and fill that world and kind of give that world the life that they need. The technological aspect is uh, a very interesting and exciting part of working at Territory. We have uh, different pieces of technology floating around the office all the time, VR headsets, we're working in augmented reality with a lot of coding. We have people coming in doing projection work um, for some uh, design festivals during, um, in London 
And uh, it's a very interesting atmosphere. We, we pride ourselves in constantly pushing the technology, technological aspect of our work. And that, um, that aspect of our work hopefully reflects in the films that we do and uh, in, in the future. A big portion of the work that we do at Territory is uh, our onset graphics. So onset graphics are um, basically there in film, you either do, as a post designer, you either do film or you either do visual effects or you do um, what's called onset graphics. Um, they, they intermingle definitely, but essentially what you're seeing here is a, the, um, the set of American Assassin. And we created um, dozens of screens for this film. And essentially what happens is we have um, screens that we send the director, they sign those screens off, say they look good, say they all kind of form this cohesive story that they're trying to create. And then we talk to um, a playback company. The one we work with generally is uh, CompuHire, and they're, uh, they're based out of London. And what they do is they figure out the size and dimensions of all the screens that, we, that we've created and what, the and what the director wants. Generally, if we're working on like some sort of like CIA room like this, we have a lot of LCD monitors that we're playing back on. Um, for Guardians of the Galaxy, we used a lot of um, a lot of iPads, a lot of different uh, like all, all those uh, control consoles in the submarine over there are, are iPads. And what they'll do is they'll um, they loop all of our animations. So we send them looped animations. And if a character or an actor is interacting with these animations, they uh, they play. We send them uh, individual impegs of every single action that's happening. So if um, for example, if Star-Lord's going up and pressing a button on a screen and it has to form some sort of animation as he, as he pushes it, we'll, have, we'll essentially have like an idle animation going up to that button push. And as soon as he's about ready to push the button, the playback guys will press that button. It'll, it'll access our animation. It'll make the animation happen. And then it'll, it's a, essentially a sequence of animations that we send them. So um, if you can see on the side, one of our... Um, one of our guys, Jay, is, uh, is on set here at, uh, on the American Assassin set. Um, we sent guys out for Blade Runner, for um, Affinity War, and a fairly large amount of films. Uh, all the Marvel films, we generally send our guys out on set. And what, the, what happens is we're working on a laptop, um, generally behind uh, the whole production area. And we have um, a very small workstation, not very powerful. And it's important that all the graphics that we do are easily changeable and very flexible because the director can come up to us and say, all right, I need this animation to uh, change somehow. I need it to be a different color. I need this object to move a different way because it's either it's like not working in his shot or they need it to, to fulfill a different story beat. And generally, we have about 30 minutes to complete this. So it's a really quick turnaround time. I know if you work in, in the industry at all, you, you know about deadlines and tight deadlines. There's nothing um, more tight than having an entire production crew, the director, a well-known director, well-known actors waiting for you to, to get your work done on After Effects or Cinema 4D. So what we traditionally do in uh, situations like this is that we build the majority of our work as pre-renders. So we start, we go in Cinema 4D, we build all of our 3D assets, we pre-render those, we'll color them in After Effects, so we'll apply like, we'll, um, apply like a levels or curves to them, give them good contrast, and I'll show you this later, but we apply like um, effects to give them different colors and glows and stuff like that. So we try to keep it um, out of like the heavy rendering as much as possible because we have to be very flexible throughout this process. Um, here's the set that we were on for uh, Guardians of the Galaxy. Uh, the, uh, or sorry, for Infinity War on the Guardian's new ship. And as you can see, a lot of the screens are kind of oblong shape. They're, uh, they're not necessarily like HD or 16.9. So we had to create special um, mats to go in over our UI to make them fit. Um, this is supposed to be like a futuristic looking spaceship, so it's not a bunch of uh, standard HD monitors that you'd find. It makes it look a bit more... Um, yeah, a bit more uh, futuristic. But uh, all the glass screens, and if you've seen the film, all these glass screens have, uh, have animation and work inside of them. Um, they're shooting on blue screen generally. And um, the majority of the time, we'll send them a bunch of animations. They'll put these on there. 
And if they have any like, specific requests after a shooting, then we'll redo those in post. And that requires like tracking and uh, like planar tracking and uh, and uh, yeah, some animation amends. So I'm going to go ahead and show you our uh, Avengers Infinity War reel. And it'll show you the, the different types of work that we did and the different screens. If you've seen the film, uh, you probably have seen the work. There, there's a lot of bit of uh, UI pieces and, and interfaces kind of bubbling around in the background. And uh, yeah, it just gives you an idea of kind of the, the overall kind of look and feel of the, uh, the film that we worked on. We, I, I will say that we did work on Guardians 1 as well, and we created all their interfaces. And I'll kind of go through the process of how we created those, the differences between the two films, and what was expected on Infinity War. Um, so that gives you kind of an overview of the type of work that we did for uh, the ship. Um, so reimagining the ship was, um, we spoke to the director at first, and when we first uh, had this conversation, they wanted the um, user interface to feel like it was in the same world of Guardians of the Galaxy. So we're kind of, if you've seen that, uh, if, the, if you've seen the films, obviously you know that they're kind of a group of like goofy bandit kind of um, well, comedic group that's uh, going, throughout this, going throughout space. And, and everything is very saturated, very colorful. Um, essentially, what they wanted to do was the previous designs were very solidified. Everything had kind of a, a very specific purpose. And since this ship was brand new, they wanted everything to have this kind of nebulous, like abstract look to it. Um, some of the previous designs that we did for Guardians 1, you can kind of see that these are um, very concrete and kind of, you can kind of imagine they have a very specific purpose. Um, the, the design's very detailed. They're all kind of this golden uh, hue. And the contrast with that is the new designs that we did, which are obviously a lot more saturated. Um, all the kind of the elements are, um, very rounded, very playful looking, and uh, it's a, a lot, a lot more pared back than the previous designs. So you can see, like the top two, um, the top two designs on the screen are very abstract. You probably wouldn't know what those really do in the ship. Uh, the bottom are a bit more practical. We have the gunner module and uh, the status, the ship status. Um, I'll be breaking down this uh, screen right here and showing you how to create the, uh, the hologram module and how we worked in Cinema 4D and also After Effects. Um, this is one of the command modules in the ship as well. And I'll show how we created this really quickly in Cinema 4D um, using basic shapes and a couple different deformers. Um, everything we created here, um, we tried to keep it as simple as possible. It doesn't have to be complicated when you're making this stuff. Um, what you want to do is you want to approach it from a very um, strategic standpoint. Um, very detailed things don't have to be detailed in their workflow. And I'll go ahead and show you how to, uh, how to do that. OK. All righty. So I'm going to show you how to make uh, how to make this hologram gun um, gun model that we that we that we created, and uh, essentially, 
it's nothing, um, nothing super detailed. So we're not going to, this isn't going to be a very technical kind of like um, figuring out how to push certain buttons. It's a very kind of, we needed something to work. Um, we had this hologram idea. Um, it had to render fast, and we wanted to come up with this interesting, kind of colorful idea. And the cool thing about working with stylized 3D is generally when you're not working with photoreal stuff is it renders really quickly, it's really fast, and uh, you can have a bit more fun with some of the abstract um, abstractions to it. So um, this is essentially, when we were creating the film, when we were creating all this UI, this is our output from Cinema 4D. So this takes like three seconds on this computer. Our computers usually render these out in like a second or under a second a frame. It's essentially a model that we have, and uh, we applied some ambient occlusion to it and a very basic skylight rig. What we do then, as I'll show you in After Effects, is how we um, took this model and colored it and made it ready for uh, the on-screen process. But what I'll show you today is how we would create this normally for like a visual effects workflow and kind of the different processes and layering that we'd go through to create this type of a uh, user interface. So essentially what this is, is a model that we got of this gun module of the ship. And what we're going to do here is just go ahead. We're going to delete this texture. We're going to start brand new again. But when you're creating UI, like especially the futuristic UI, the idea is to layer everything. So we're going to create multiple layers. You generally could do this in passes from Cinema 4D. But you want to create detail through different layering, essentially. Um, so all holograms um, generally have kind of a um, transparent quality to them. So we, uh, we worked on um, Ghost, Ghost in the Shell last year, and we created solograms for them. So those were like solid holograms, but they ended up still being semi-transparent. We were always kind of like trying to figure out whether we could actually do like a, a sol an actual solid hologram. But a hologram itself, and people identify with like this um, transparent structure. So what we're going to do is add a, a Fresnel shader to the transparency. If you work in Cinema 4D, you're very familiar with the Fresnel shader. It adds, um, it makes the what the point that you're looking at in the center invisible and the sides um, not invisible. So what we're going to do is add our interactive render region to this and stick our texture on here. Okay. And then we're going to go ahead and turn our color off. And we're going to work out of our luminance channel. So we're not really going to get any shading from this, but that's OK. We're going to add a gradient to this. And as you saw before, our color palette was very saturated, very colorful. We're going to keep into that same kind of look and feel. We're going to go with something a bit hot, blue there, and maybe some pink over here. Don't be afraid to use pink in your designs, especially working with Guardians of the Galaxy. It's, it's definitely a part of the process. And I'm going to rotate the camera there. So we're starting to get this little, um, this kind of like holographic looking shape. And it's starting to come together a bit. What we're going to next do is all kind of user interface work has a lot of like graphical lines around them. Um, generally, like, I mean, even like Blueprint or kind of uh, yeah, like Blueprint type work as well. But you'll see that. There's in a lot of intricate lines going on with uh, holograms or uh, futuristic looking UI. And what we usually do with that is we create, um, we use the Sketch and Tune module in Cinema 4D. Um, working at Territory, I've, I've had the chance to really kind of go in depth with the Sketch and Tune module. It's super powerful. It's really fast to render. And uh, I found it very helpful, especially in uh, tight production situations. So I'm going to go ahead and just show you really quickly how you may approach this. So you'd start with uh, your base model. You're going to create a sketch and tune shader here, sketch material. We're going to apply that to our, our base model. And generally, uh, the default settings for sketch and tune are they show a, a white background, which we're going to turn off, and they give you kind of this tune shaded uh, quantizing kind of look. So we're going to turn that off as well. We want it to only affect the edges of the model and nothing else. And you can also override that in this tag here. So we're going to do that. And then we're going to go into our sketch and tune shader, and we're going to change the color. We don't want it to be black because it's not showing up off the background. We're going to give it kind of this yellow, like this bluish, hot blue color. 
Okay, and then we're going to drop our thickness down because we want these to be like elegant looking lines. We don't want them to be over powerful and too cartoony. So as you can see, as I've been building this, it's, it's quite slow because what's happening is Sketch and Tune is trying to calculate all the edges all at once and there's a lot of geometry in this model. This model wasn't built in Cinema 4D, it was probably built in like Maya or some sort of CAD um, program. So it's, it's um, triangulated and very dense. So what we're going to do here is a trick that we do quite a bit at Territory is um, one, of my, one of my favorite tools is you take the model and you go into edge mode here. And so, see, you can see all the different edges here. It's really helpful. And we're going to go to our Fong break selection. And what this does is it selects all the break, like the, if you've used a Fong tag before, it essentially will take an edge and try to smooth it out without adding any subdivisions. So this selection is finding all those Fong breaks and uh, trying to figure out um, those different um, kind of um, spaces where the kind of the geometry will uh, intersect. So you can override the Fong tag um, and go ahead and like tweak it a bit. So you can see like you can see like as you lower the Fong angle, it's starting to select more and more of the model. We don't need that much uh, that much control. So I'm going to go back to the default settings and just click select all. And what's going to happen here is we're going to go up to our mesh command and we're going to go edge to spline. And what this is going to do is we don't, and we don't need this extra bit anymore. So this is going to be our spline. So we've essentially created, taken that entire selection and made a spline out of it. And this spline is super fast to render. You can render um, very complex pieces of geometry using this method. And uh, it looks, it can look really cool too, especially if you're able to put some depth of field on it, render it in like Redshift or use some sort of a uh, uh, depth in After Effects. But uh, as before, we're going to remove the edges. We're going to take, um, we're going to have it uh, calculate the splines now. Go into here. Okay. And now it renders super fast. So beforehand, um, I did this on, I, I tested this on my own computer um, at work, and it was about 10, 12 seconds for a uh, sketch and tune render, and it was like a second for, um, for uh, the spline render. But as I said before, when you're on set, seconds count. You have 30 minutes from the moment that you get the brief to change something, and that includes rendering time. So if you're going to work in Cinema 4D, then pump that into After Effects. You've already lost about 10 minutes, so it's really important that if you're rendering a 300 frame sequence, it's not going to take a minute of frame. You need it to be like seconds and like really low on the second scale. So um, I'm going to go ahead and turn the Sorry, I'm going to go ahead and turn the interactive render region back on. And this is way too thick, so we're going to go ahead and drop it a bit more. Okay. And what we can do, um, you can also set this up with the take system where you're rendering out each of these passes individually, and that's normally what we do to have the most uh, control. But what we're going to do is build this all at once. So you can start seeing the, the Fresnel shader kind of come through a bit. We're going to drop down our sketch material even more, 0.05. We just kind of want it to have like, yeah, a bit of a feel, give it a bit of a futuristic looking look. All right. And from there, we're going to add uh, our X particles pass. So X particles, we tend to use quite a bit in futuristic looking UI. There's a lot of control um, using X particles. It's a, especially, I'll show you a really simple way to get a lot of detail out of this. So we're going to duplicate our original model. I'm going to go ahead and middle mouse button click on the, um, on the, the null, the top null of the hierarchy, and it'll select everything inside, um, inside that null, which is really helpful. I'm going to connect objects and delete. So now I have another version of that. I'm going to turn off this guy and this guy just to keep it simple. All right. And now I have, uh, I have my model. I'm going to delete that skylight just for easy use. All right. And I'm going to go back into point mode and delete this. So we're basically going to use this as an emitter. So we're going to go into our X particles um, drop down. 
we're going to create an emitter. And what we want to do is we can play the emitter. It's, it's off screen because this is not centered to the world. So what we're going to do is go into our settings, go into our object, and we're going to add our model into our object panel. So it's all these, um, we can actually turn, hide this. You can see all the, all the particles are flying all over the place. That's not really what we want. It can look kind of interesting, especially how it's making this kind of like cross pattern, but that's not what we want. We want it to stick to the object. I'm going to go ahead and drop the timeline down a bit. So you can kind of see it's, it's, it's tracing the shape of the object that, we've, uh, that we have, the gun object. And we're going to go in here. And it doesn't look, we don't really want it to fill up the object like a, some sort of um, volume. We can go through. And just really quickly, you can kind of like see what it looks like. It's going polygon area, points, edges is, yeah. So generally, we'll go with points. And what we'll do is you can go change into your mission and change it from rate to shot. And this gives you, it, it shoots a, a large amount of particles out in the first like whatever specific uh, duration of frames that you wanted to shoot out at. And we're going to do something like 10,000 just to see what that looks like. OK, starting to fill up a bit. We're going to go a bit crazy. We're going to do 50,000. OK, cool. All right, so now we have our, um, all of our, partic our particle paths. We're going to go into our shader add our X particles material and apply that to our emitter. And then we go back to our render region. And then we are going to drop these down to very, very tiny. And we're going to give them some variation, because that makes it look like there are more. So you can kind of see what that's looking like. And we're going to make these. You can kind of change the color. If you're doing passes, you can, you can, you can change the colors in After Effects. You don't have to do it in Cinema. Um, generally, we try to be in Cinema for as little as possible and do all our changing in After Effects. But um, if we're doing a visual effects workflow, we do all of our colors in Cinema. OK. All right. So now we're going to go ahead and turn that off and turn our Fresnel back on and our Spline back on. And this will kind of give you an idea of what this is looking like. Let me just stick that under here so it has the same animation. All right. Cool. OK. And typically on a machine with a really powerful CPU and a couple of GPU processors, this is quite a fast render. But you can see just like the building blocks of what I'm trying to create here. You can see the, we have like the, the dot pass, which we can modify in After Effects. We have our Fresnel pass. And we also have our Sketch and Tune uh, spline passes. So um, we'd probably, in this situation, we'd probably go ahead and change the colors of our particles in post. And uh, that's what I'll show you. Um, right now. So we have our, here is our After Effects composition. So we have our, our um, entire um, Illustrator file in here. We have all the assets we created in 2D. And what we're going to do is I'm going to show you how we composited this together in After Effects using the same passes that we just made. So we have, first we have our, um, our beauty pass, which is our Fresnel shader, or sorry, which is um, our actual um, is the initial render that I showed you at the beginning. So it's just a base model with ambient occlusion applied to it. Um, some lighting. Here is what it looks like without any effects on it. So it's a very basic kind of gray model that you'd get out of Cinema 4D, like a hardware render, pra render practically. We apply a levels to that to get the contrast up. And then CC Toner has been really helpful. Um, it allows us to change the colors of our highlights, midtones, and shadows. If the director says he wants everything to feel like it's a bit more blue, a bit more green, we can, we can do that very simply in After Effects. And then what we do is we add another layer of our Fresnel shader, which I showed you before. And that gives it kind of this transparent quality to that. And then we're going to start adding um, a reflection pass, which you can add on top of your um, beauty pass. And um, you can attain that pass through your multi-pass settings. 
Then we have our spline, our wireframe, our wireframe render, which you can kind of see here. It's very thin, adds just an extra layer of detail, and another, um, another outline pass. And here's our X particles pass. You can see it, we're just applying a, um, a tint on it and changing the tint to a, um, this kind of like highlighter um, aquamarine color. You can change that wherever you want. If you want it to be red, a again, if the director comes over and he says he wants things to change, we can do that. And um, then we have our mask at the top, which, which gives it, uh, which cuts out the back from the front of the model. So um, here is that. This is gen our general workflow with um, with these screen graphics. I'm going to go ahead and show you our uh, one of the other assets that we used and created in the film. Um, this asset, we really like this one. Um, it was actually one of those kind of like quick concepts that we created. Um, it's very abstract. If you, this is one of your chances when you're working on Guardians of the Galaxy to do like abstract motion graphics. You see this everywhere nowadays, but to actually get paid and to have a project like this is fantastic. It's very creative, um, creative and kind of liberating. Uh, so essentially what we did with this is it's a, a super simple animation. The only thing that's moving in this scene is the camera. So we've, we've attached a camera to an aligned display, um, use an aligned dis display tag. Um, it makes it really easy to loop because we just set the in and, and the out at the, uh, the full 10 seconds of the, uh, the composition. And to create this, it may look more complicated than it is, but it's essentially, essentially we used a a stock model of um, these rims, these wheels, and we created, um, we used these tube assets and torus, like very simple, like pieces of geometry that you would, um, yeah, that you can just get out of uh, the basic, uh, out of your um, cinema fort, the, this area up here. And uh, we kind of just modified them a slight bit. So I'll just take this top part and bring it to a new scene just to show you. So we have our tire and kind of our um, different pieces of geometry aligned to spline. I'm going to bring this into a new scene to show you how we made this guy. It looks really cool, very complicated, but it's not. It is being driven 100% by this spherified deformer. So it's essentially a stack of tubes that we have offset in space. So I'm going to delete. I'm actually going to just gonna try to take this very top part so you can get a good, good idea of what this is doing. So this is essentially what we've made is all these different tubes. We've edited them. We've pulled out um, the sides usually using a cloner. This gives them a bit more detail around the side, but you don't, you don't have to do this. I'll switch to the hidden line display so you can see this a bit better. So you can kind of see like very simple geometry. Okay, and then we just apply this. Bring this back down. All right. So you, we applied that spherify deformer to it, and we essentially use this spherify deformer to model this asset. Um, you can use this obviously to animate. It gives it some like kind of really really strange like organic looking animations to it. Um, whenever we're working on something that's organic looking and a bit uh, that's not. Um, that's a bit of an organic, well, a, an organic shape. We, uh, we tend to go into our deformers panel, and these are super helpful in giving us um, interesting looks and feels very quickly. We use the displacer quite often. Um, you can attach things to uh, the spline wrap um, deformer, which we use quite a bit, and obviously like the bending and twisting and all that stuff. So these are really powerful tools that we use all the time in production, and this concept um, was made a lot easier with just uh, one of these deformers and experimenting in different shapes and looks of the uh, of the elements. So I'm going to go ahead and go back into my presentation. Okay. All right. Yeah. So that that's it. Um, thank you very much. If you have any questions or anything about uh, the workflow or the type of work we did, I'm happy to talk to you about those. You can uh, message me on Twitter. Um, you're happy to follow uh, Territory Studio, and you can message me through them as well. 
Um, we're all very supportive, and if you have any great uh, UI examples or any type of work that you'd like to share with us, we're happy to take a look at that. And uh, yeah, thank you very much for coming and listening.